Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Deep Dive into Stock Charts, an in-depth look at StockCharts.com features. I am Chip Anderson, I'm your host, I'm the president of StockCharts.com, and I'm very glad to welcome you to the show. This is one of my favorite shows because again, we get to go into a lot of detail about what's gonna, what the feature that we're talking about. Today we're gonna be talking about creating charts with overlays. We're gonna be looking at all the different overlay options that are available on our Sharp Charts platform. And I want to make sure that you're, by the end of the show, that you know exactly how to use all the different capabilities that are part of our overlay um, feature. So, um, a couple of FAQs beforehand, similar to our other shows. First off, we are recording this. It'll be up on YouTube in a little bit. Uh, after the show is over, you'll be able to go back and look at it then. Of course, you can always scrub back on the, um, on the Stock Church TV player if you want it. If I'm going too fast or if I, you miss something, you want to see it again, you can always do that too. Um, this is a live show, and you can ask us questions. The, the reason that we're here, the reason we're doing this live is so you can ask us questions. We've got the little Slido chat box off there to the right, and I have my good friend Rachel with me today. Say hi, Rachel. Hello. And uh, if anybody wants to, y'all just right now, type a little hello message to Rachel in the Slido channel. I'm sure she'd love to see that. Um, but if I uh, talk about something and you want more detail or, or I wasn't clear, by all means, let us know in the Slido channel. I do have to stay on topic during this show. I can't like go off onto um, completely other uh, areas of the website. So I want to stay focused on sharp charts and overlays in your questions. So if that's possible, good, because I, <laughs> I do love going off on tangents. So <laughs> you guys have to help me stay on topic here. Um, so let's keep the, the, uh, the questions on topic. And there is a downloadable version of the slides that I'm showing you right now. It's up on our website now. There's the web address you can see right there, uh, d.stockchurch.com slash tv slash deep dive 191214.pdf, all lowercase. Okay? And so that, that's another way that you can kind of keep, on, keep up with everything, all the information that I'm going to be giving you uh, in this show. So what we're talking about in this show is a key feature of our Sharp Charts charting tool. And so I'm going to assume most of you are fairly familiar with Sharp Charts, but I do want to go over some basics and also make sure we're clear on the terminology because there's a couple of little bits of terminology that if you're not clear on, the whole thing's going to sound um, a little confusing. Uh, just rem a reminder, Sharp Charts is our premier charting tool. All the charts that Sharp Charts creates in the Sharp Charts workbench area of our website are, is created as a PNG format uh, image. It's an image just like any other picture that you see on the web. Uh, you can click and... and uh, you can save it, you can cut and paste it into another application, you can put it on a blog, any of those kind of things. It works on any device, very easy to use. Um, and you can make them up to 2,500 uh, pixels wide if you are a member of our pro service and uh, fairly wide if you're a member of other services. And they will grow to be as tall as necessary. The more indicators you add to them, um, so on and so forth, the bigger they'll get. Um, now, Sharp Charts is not, uh, we're coming up, we're, we're getting to have two charting platforms. We have Sharp Charts, which is our old legacy system, which is still great and wonderful. That's what we're going to be talking about today. But we also now have a new um, platform called Stock Charts ACP. Not the topic of this show, but I just want you to know about it. That's the um, platform that you use if you want to have your charts fill up your entire screen and if you want interactive streaming charts. So Stock Charts ACP is the thing to check out for that. All right, so let's get into it. Stock charts, um, sharp charts have different elements. So when you're first looking at a chart, I want to I wanna just take a quick little um, tour of all the different things that we see. So at the very top, we have what we call the header panel. That's going to have your latest quote. It's also going to have the ticker symbol. In this case, um, GOOG, G-O-O-G, the ticker symbol of the main price plot, the main um, data set that we're plotting on this particular chart. Uh, it'll also have the date and time that the chart was created and have some other information like uh, whether it's gone up or gone down. Um, the main price plot area, all charts have one of these and only one of these. Uh, and we see this one here. It's, it's in the, typically in the middle of the chart, and that's what we see here. It's where the bars or the candlesticks will be located. Um, it also is where the overlays are, and that's the subject of today's show. So we're going to be getting more into detail about all the lines that appear inside of the price plot uh, panel. Um, and again, just some, some clarity on the terminology here. There is the concept of a technical indicator, and then there is the concept of overlays and indicators. Technical indicator is a universal concept. 
overlays versus indicators, that's something that is only that we are, I'm going to be using here in the, in the context of sharp charts. It's going to be a very specific um, thing. So a technical indicator, the more general concept, is any formula that uses open, high, low, close, and volume to come up with a line or a signal that you see appear on the chart. So that's, that could be something that sits on top of the bars. That could be something that's in an indi indicator panel above or below. It could be anything. Um, so that's the, more, that's the general concept. But in the context of sharp charts, when we're talking about sharp charts, an overlay is a technical indicator that is plotted on the same scale as the price bars and therefore appears on top of the price bars. And also it's potentially possible for the price bars to interact with that, with that particular technical indicator. So a technical indicator that's on top of the price bars is an overlay, but a technical indicator that is on a different scale, and there are many of these, um, MACD, PPO, so on and so forth, those are all plotted on a different scale. They're not on the same scale as the prices. They have to be plotted in a separate window. And so we call those sharp charts indicators, and we put them in different windows above and below the price plot area. We will talk about those on a future show. On today's show, we're going to be focused mostly on this middle thing, sharp charts overlays. Okay? So again, just, just wanted to clarify the terminology there. That's, this is where overlays live, again, in the price plot panel there in the middle. And uh, those are indicators panels above and below, just to give you a sense of what those are. And again, we'll, hopefully we'll do another show on those uh, a little later. They're not, they're not too difficult, but they're, they're not exactly the same as overlays. Now, um, just to complete this, uh, our little tour of the charting. Uh, there's a price plot legend um, that appears on the price plot panel in the upper left corner. And then similarly, the indicator panels, if there are any, uh, will also have legends that are above and below. The legend will contain the most recent value for the indicator. It'll also give you a sense of what color corresponds to which indicator, if there are multiple ones there, so on and so forth. Now, we also have added um, something, you can turn this off, but usually people have this on, it's called the, the y-axis labels. And those will also show you the final value, the, the right side value of any indicators and any, any of the price bars that appear on your chart. So you can refer to those or you can look in the values inside the legends, either way. Now, um, just, to, just to clarify, there's a primary vertical axis on the right side of the chart. Um, that's typically where most people are looking because you're typically looking for the most up-to-date information on your chart. And so that's where all the primary information will exist. Um, so you'll see, like for instance, um, in the case of the price plot area, on the primary vertical axis, that will be, the, the axis will contain the values for the stock and the stock's or particular um, range of values. On the other side, it, it's not always used, but it can be, uh, will be a secondary vertical axis. And this is where additional overlay information can appear. Now in this case, we only can plot one um, value on the secondary vertical axis. And right now, for this particular chart, we've chosen to plot the volume. So you see that there's a scale for volume because volume is overlaid on top of price. Uh, and you can see that there. If there were other things overlaid on top of this chart, you might see those values instead. Okay, so just real quickly, uh, that, that completes our tour of, of a sharp chart. I guess there's also the, the time axis. I didn't really go over that, but that's at the bottom of the chart, and it's pretty clear on, on what that is. Uh, I just want to make just pause right here, see if we had any questions that have come in at this point. Um, I, again, I want to encourage you to send some questions if I'm unclear or if any of this isn't making any sense. But I'm going to now assume everyone's really clear on the, these different elements of the chart, and we're going to dive into... Um, just a little bit on the workbench, but then more into overlays and how you create overlays. Now, the workbench itself is where you create sharp charts. And to get to the workbench, typically, you'll just type a ticker symbol at the top of any of our pages. If you go to our website, there's a box at the top. Just type in a ticker symbol, anyone will do, and press go, and you'll go straight to the sharp charts workbench. Now, the workbench itself has four different areas. Actually, I guess technically five different areas. It has the top part, which is the place where you specify the main ticker symbol, the period, and auto refresh settings, and a couple other things are up there. Then there's the chart, the thing that I don't have on my list here. The chart is, is just below that. 
Below that is an area for the chart attributes. Chart attributes are things that apply to the chart as a whole, like range. We're not going to talk about those today. Then there's the chart overlays area. That's where we're going to focus in on. Everything we're going to be talking about is in this chart overlays area, just below the chart attributes area, which is just below the chart itself. And then finally, at the bottom of the workbench are chart indicators. And again, those are what we'll talk about later. So maybe some other show. Here's what the overlay area looks like if you scroll down. So basically above the screen here would be where the chart is. And I've now scrolled down a little bit and you see this overlay section. I do also want to point out there's a little green triangle. And if you're new to stock charts, you want to click this triangle. It's going to open up these additional uh, capabilities, um, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, style, color, opacity, so on and so forth. We want to um, we want to have access to all the different capabilities in the overlays area, so be sure to click that green triangle and get all those things available to you. And then we can see below this is the indicator area, but this is the overlay area we're going to be focusing on. The idea is you make some changes here, and then you press the update button, and those changes will then get reflected in your chart. And remember, overlays are things, lines, that are drawn on top of the price bars. That's the best way to remember them. There are many different overlays to choose from. You'll choose them in this overlays dropdown. At this point, on this particular example, we've got two simple moving averages selected, but there are a whole bunch more. And if you click on the, uh, the dropdown here, you'll see a list of everything that we have. Um, probably over 30 of them, I think, something like that. Um, and you can add up to 25 overlays to a chart. Now, that doesn't look like you can do it here because we've only got three lines. But as you fill in more lines, um, additional empty lines will appear automatically. And you can do that until you have up to 25 overlays specified. And in fact, I'm going to show you a technique where, where you might start to actually use a large number of overlays as a result. Okay, so what is it exactly, what are some examples of overlays? Well, the, the ones that we've seen a minute ago and, uh, and I'll show you right now are simple moving averages. Simple moving averages um, have, a, have a period setting, a single period setting. We see here the 50 period moving average in blue and a 200 period moving average in red. Um, in this case, the period is a day because this is a daily chart. So it's a 50 day moving average, 200 day moving average. And we see them on the chart here overlaying our price bars. So simple moving averages, again, what you do is you take the last 50 values, you add them all up, and then you divide by 50. And that's how you calculate it. It's very simple, simple moving averages. Um, now there's another kind of moving average, and I'm going to just take a little, I'm going to show them to you, but also take a little side note here, um, called exponential moving averages. Exponential moving averages are faster than simple moving averages, and they form the basis for a large number of technical indicators. So it's really kind of important to understand exponential moving averages and how they work. So what I've done on this chart is I've kept my two simple moving averages, MA and MA, and I've added two uh, exponential moving averages, EMAs, uh, a 50 period EMA in, in um, dark blue and a 50 period, I'm sorry, 200 period EMA in dark red. So the, the, um, the brighter blue, um, that's a little thicker, is the EMA and the lighter blue that's a little shaded is the SMA. And notice that the blue typically is closer to the price bars than the, uh, than the simple moving average. The EMA here in dark blue is closer to these price bars than the SMA. That's what we mean when we say that the, the EMA is faster than the SMA. It reacts faster. It, it stays closer to what the price is actually doing. And so when things turn, so on and so forth, the, the EMA will turn faster than the SMA. SMA is, a, is kind of a slow, uh, conservative, you know, stodgy, indicator and the EMA is a little, is its little faster cousin um, saying, hey, let's go here, let's go here. So a lot of people really um, enjoy using EMAs. Now the, the interesting thing about EMAs is you have to use much more data in order to calculate them accurately. Whereas with an SMA, you just need 50 data points in the, in the case of a 50 period one. A 50 period EMA, you don't need, you need way, way more than 50 um, data points. You need uh, potentially up to three years, four years of data points in order to get it fully accurate. And uh, we actually do that. We take the time to make sure that we have enough data to calculate these EMAs effectively and accurately. Um, so you'll see that. But that's one of the reasons that, that you, they're not as, um, they may not be available in some uh, simpler software. Anyway, all right, so back on track. That's what an EMA looks like. 
and uh, they're useful. Another kind of overlay that we'll see here a lot of is Bollinger Bands. And I've got a whole other slide on Bollinger Bands. I'll come back to them in a little bit. But you see there, they're basically an envelope, a range of where we think prices might live and stay. And I'll explain more about why that is later. Uh, just to give you, a, again, a, a quick tour of all the different options that are available. Another one, another kind of overlay, looks very dissimilar to everything else we just, we've just seen, are parabolic SAR dots. And so basically these are, um, SAR stands for um, stop and reverse. And these, this indicator basically calculates where you might want to put your stop point when you buy a stock, and then at what point you might want to sell it. You absolutely need to read more about all of these indicators in chart school before you, uh, you do something that simple. Uh, but parabolic SAR is a really interesting one to look into. Volume by price, another one that's very interesting. This is a set of uh, histogram bars that stick out from the left side. And every time the, the stock closes within a particular range, so let's say this range here, which is essentially 42 to 44, let's say, somewhere in there. Anytime the stock closed between 42 and 44, which it did over in this region, we go down and we find the volume the amount, the, the, the total volume for that particular bar, and we add it to our total here. So this represents the total of all the volume that occurred whenever the stock closed between 42 and 44 on this chart. Which, and that's really nice. It helps you determine and find very quickly support and resistance zones. So anytime there's a big bar sticking out, like there is in, the, in this case down here, um, that represents or indicates that there's a support and resistance level nearby. And you'll probably be able to spot it um, by looking with, your, uh, uh, with our chart notes annotation tool. But anyway, that's what volume by price is, and that's how it works. Again, more information on all this stuff can be found in our chart school area. I'll have a, I'll have a link for you at the end of the presentation. Here's another indicator that's really a, a multiple indicator, and we're going to talk a lot about this in just a minute. It's called a moving average ribbon. What it really is is just a whole bunch of moving averages all with different colors and slightly different settings. So I go from 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, all the way up to 80, I think, yeah. And then you see how this forms a ribbon, if you will. It looks kind of like the old uh, disk drive ribbons from, the, uh, from my old Apple II days. But anyway, just a, an old ribbon that kind of folds back and forth on itself. And, uh, and sometimes it gets very broad, and other times it gets very narrow, and sometimes it, it, it flips over and other times it, it, um, it widens out. And so it's very, very interesting to see that. So this is, this is something that we'll be talking about more because I, like uh, I like the ribbon concept. All right, so let me go back to the specifics of how to add these overlays that we just went to. And there are many more, there are many more. I just gave you a, a taste of the different overlays that we have. Uh, but I want to show you how you can add an overlay to a particular um, uh, chart. Uh, here using the overlay area of the Sharp Charts Workbench. Basically, again, you, what you do is you select what you want from the dropdown. You, you add whatever parameters you need. Some indicators take just one parameter. Other indicators take two or three uh, with, uh, that you use commas to separate from. You can also then choose what style you want to use for it, what color you want to use for it, and what opacity you want to use for it. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a minute as well. And once you've done that, then you can press update and your overlay will appear on the chart. If for some reason you need to um, swap around the order that they appear, you can use these little reorder triangles that you see here to move stuff up and move stuff down. Um, and as I mentioned before, if, uh, if you fill up the first three rows uh, here in the overlay area, we'll add a fourth row and a fifth row, so on and so forth, all the way down again to 25. And if you want to start over from scratch, you can click on the clear all link right here. And that will, that will basically remove all of the overlays from your chart so you can start, up, start over. All right, so this is a question we get a lot um, in customer support. We get it from, uh, well, actually, I mean, it's a question I have myself. Uh, it's a pretty normal and natural question. Everyone seems to, once they kind of get the mechanics of how to add overlays, then they're, they're faced with a, with a quandary. What's the best parameters I should use for this particular indicator, this particular overlay, this particular technical indicator, so on and so forth. There's got to be some best parameters, right? And what a lot of people will do is they will use, um, maybe without realizing it, they'll use the default parameters. Because, and we do have, basically every time you add an indicator to your chart, we'll stick in some default indicators. 
But believe it or not, some of them are, some of those defaults are fairly randomly chosen. They're, they were chosen by the person who invented the indicator and first published it in a, uh, in a document somewhere. That's where we found, found them. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean those are the right parameters that, for you. Remember, every investor is different. Every investor has different risk tolerances. They have different time horizons. They have different um, approaches to investing and deciding when to buy and sell stocks. Making sure you're using the parameters that are best for you is super important uh, in terms of becoming a successful technician. So how do you know what are the best parameters for me? I can't tell you what the best parameters for you are. I wish I could. It'd be really nice, really easy. Um, and uh, that's what a lot of people, again, write in for. Uh, they write into customer support and say, what's the best we should use? Well, unfortunately, it does require a little bit of work on your part. That's the bad news. The good news is it's kind of fun. The work is actually kind of fun. And I'll show you, I'll show you how uh, and why um, I, th I say that. It's what I'll call the ribbon technique. And we saw a hint of this a, little, a minute ago. Um, the ribbon technique is a way to learn more about the personality of an indicator. When you're first testing an indicator, when you're first trying it out, you're, you're putting it on like a coat. You're seeing, you know, does it fit well? Does it, does it work for me? And so you're going to be studying it. And the way, what the first thing I think you should do is you should overlay it on top of itself multiple times. But each time you do that, you should vary a, a parameter. One of, if it takes more than, if it takes a single parameter, just vary that parameter. If it takes several parameters, pick one and just vary that, that one parameter, leave the other ones the same. And then put it on top of itself several times. So you're varying the parameters by a constant amount. That's going to give you a, a, a chart. You're going to end up with a chart. It's not going to be a chart that you're going to use for trading or, or ultimately that you're going to end up keeping around. But it's a chart for you to learn the personality of the indicator, if you will. The, the way that the indicator reacts in different situations. So you can then go back in time, maybe find a place where the stock took a big dive or maybe the stock uh, went on a big upward run and then see what all those different, see what that ribbon of information did during that particular time. So what is the how does the indicator behave when the stock's moving up? How does the indicator behave when the stock's moving sideways? How does the indicator behave when the stock's moving lower? If you have a ribbon of, of a lot of different versions of the same per indicator, just slightly different parameters, you'll be able to learn the answer to those questions. So let's do that. Let's do that. Um, I mentioned the, the moving average ribbon a minute ago. So how would we construct that? And so here's the, uh, we're back to our overlay um, area in the Sharp Charts Workbench. Uh, we're just going to start by, by adding a, a 25 period moving average at, as our first one. And we're going to leave everything else auto. And then we're going to take another simple moving average and add a 30. And then we're going to take another simple moving average and add a 35. And a 40. And a 45. And a 50. And a 55. And a 6. All the way down. You can add as many as you want. And also, I've picked five, um, which works well. But you d it depends. Uh, if, if what you're looking at is a period, then, then uh, varying it by five is probably going to do well. But if you're looking at if the parameter you're using is not a period, not a period, but maybe some other kind of uh, information, you probably you may not want to use five. So that's something that you have to experiment with to figure out what the right uh, increment is. You also probably have to experiment to figure out what the right number of elements in your ribbon should be. Uh, this is probably pretty big. I don't know if you'd really want to go much bigger than this. Um, uh, and in some cases, you, uh, that would be too many. This is, again, the, uh, the kind of display that you'll ultimately end up with if you do that moving average ribbon thing. So in this case, again, we're studying the simple moving average. And we're seeing how does it, how does it compare and how does it move relative to the price bars, for instance, right after a turn. So here we see a turn in the stock, and the stock has started to move up. And we see that the shorter period moving averages, the 25 and 50, fairly quickly uh, start rising the same point as the, uh, as the stock itself. Whereas the slower period moving averages, the uh, 80 period is here in light green, uh, it takes a while for them to turn and move higher. And that's very common. This is the, this is the, the technician conundrum is to figure out, um, 
Do I want to use a slow and steady moving uh, uh, indicator setting, uh, which will give me less whipsaws, uh, but will, will turn s slower than the stock and maybe cause me to miss out on some moves? Or do I want to use a, a shorter term indicator that's going to turn very quickly st and stay very close to the prices, but possibly give me some whipsaws, possibly um, take me out of the stock and back into the stock more frequently than I'd like. So, so finding the, the correct medium between those two is something that you have to do. The answer to that is also, again, going to appear, um, depend on your tolerance for risk, your time horizons for investing, so on and so forth. But this ribbon makes it very clear, in the case of a simple moving average, very clear um, kind of that trade-off. And maybe you can, with some more experimenting, you can find that, hey, I'm the kind of investor that really likes you know, to live on the edge and therefore a 30 period moving average works well for me. Or maybe even a, maybe even like a shorter, 20 to 15. On the other hand, you might decide, well, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a longer term investor. I don't need all this uh, anxiety and, and work. So I want a longer term moving average, say, maybe even longer than what I show here, maybe 100, uh, 150 period moving average, whatever. So this is the kind of display, and then you can put this display on multiple different kinds of charts. I've got it on a stock here from a while back called KMT, but you could put it on um, several different stocks uh, just again to get a sense of how they work. Maybe the next thing you, should, you could do, and I, and I actually would challenge you, anybody watching the show, um, here's some homework for you. Uh, go do this same thing, only instead of using uh, simple moving averages like I've done, uh, use exponential moving averages. How does that change the ribbon? What does the ribbon look like? Is it, is it um, wider? Is it narrower? Does it flip over more frequently? So on and so forth. Go ahead and find, go ahead and find out. Um, I know what I think it should be, <laughs> but um, I'm not, uh, it, let's, let's, you should do it. You should do it. Again, this is the kind of experimenting and playing with not only our tools, but also just with the charts in general. It's really gonna pay off dividends for you in the long run as you become more aware of the personality of these indicators. You ultimately, technicians uh, are going to actually, you know, place trades based on these indicators. And so you want to know their personality. This is one of the fastest ways I know of to really learn their personalities quickly. So, so that's how you can do it with moving averages. So let's talk about a different indicator because there are many different kinds. Here's, an, here's a different overlay. Touched on it earlier, but now I want to show it to you in more detail. Uh, it's called Bollinger Bands, uh, invented by John Bollinger a while back. He's written several books on the topic, very good books, and we have articles in Chart School about it as well. As we saw on that earlier chart, a Bollinger Band is essentially two lines that are drawn above and below a central moving average. And the central moving average uh, kind of you know, sits on top of the price bars, and then the, li the, ab the line above will be far near or far, that far away from that moving average and so on and so forth. The distance between that central moving average and the upper and lower lines that form this Bollinger Band env envelope is based on a measurement of volatility. So how much has the stock been moving up and down? Uh, how much has it been, um, uh, how volatile has it been? And that uh, measurement is called standard deviation. It's a, it's a typical mathematical formula from statistics. You might be familiar with it. Um, but so basically you calculate the standard deviation to a certain degree, and then you add or subtract that from that central moving average, and that's how you end up with Bollinger Bands. Um, the interesting thing here is that Bollinger Bands don't take a single parameter. Instead, they take two. Now the first parameter is something that we're kind of familiar with from what we just looked at. It's the period of that central moving average. So it's just the number of days that uh, go into the calculation of that central moving average. The second parameter is the one that's interesting to me. It is the number of standard deviations away from that central moving average that the upper and lower lines are going to be. And it's typically defined as two I think Bollinger Bands, the default is something like uh, 20 and 2. Um, but again, those numbers and the numbers, any numbers that you see when we first um, add an indicator to our charts, those are the defaults. They may not be the numbers for you. They're just the, the common numbers that the uh, inventor of the indicator uh, decided upon when they first published. So we want to spend a little bit of time learning more about Bollinger Bands 
and also in, in, as a consequence learning more about sharp charts itself. Um, but we want to be able to vary that second number, the number of standard deviations, because that's the number that we really don't, we need to know more about that one. We've already learned a little bit about what happens when you vary the, the period of a central moving average. Let's now spend a little bit of time learning about the second number, uh, standard, the number of standard deviations. Now, the whole point of Bollinger Bands is that prices tend to stay within the bands. You have to have a very volatile event to get um, prices to, to jump outside of the Bollinger Bands. Um, and that can give you some great information as a trader and as an investor as to whether or not things are oversought, overbought or oversold. Uh, another nice thing is that wide bands, if the bands are very far away, the upper and lower bounds are very far away, then there's a lot of volatility going on. On the other hand, if the stock then starts to calms down and starts to just move sideways, you'll see, it's actually pretty dramatic, you'll see that the bands come very close together. They all kind of squeeze together right around the prices. So if there's volatility, the bands will be wide. If there isn't, they'll be narrow. Um, it also, the, the, an increase in volatility is also a great indication that there's a change in trend. And so understanding trend and trend changes is something else Bollinger Bands can help you with. So this is what Bollinger Bands look like uh, right out of the box. Again, it's a 20 period uh, moving average in the middle. This dashed line that you see here is the 20 period uh, moving average going up and going down. And then above that, in this case, are two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below for this particular stock. This is IBM back in 2012. And you can see uh, there are some cases where the upper and lower uh, bands got very far apart because there was a big change in trend. And there's some cases, not many in this particular example, but maybe right here, the stock had been going sideways for a while and that caused the Bollinger Bands to contract fairly dramatically. So that's really interesting, but we still don't know if 2.0, the second, so it's 20 comma 2.0. We still don't know if this 2.0 is what we need. Do we, is that going to work for us or do we need something different? So let's learn a little more about Bollinger Bands. And my question to you before, before I show you the answer <laughs> is, you know, what would a ribbon of Bollinger Bands actually look like? And how can we set that up on our chart in such a way that it's not a big mishmash of lines going everywhere? Those are the, those are the challenges that we want to take for the next couple of, uh, next couple of minutes. All right. So um, this is to give you the answer ahead of time, and then I'll show you how to construct it. This is something I'm calling, and I just made this up, frankly. Uh, it's, I'm calling it the Volatility Valley. <laughs> I call it that because to me, and this, maybe this is just me, I'm crazy, but uh, it looks a little bit like a topographic map that you might see in the, uh, you know, on the, when you're going out and hiking and hiking into a canyon or a valley or something. The idea here is that the trail down in the, uh, in the center the valley, maybe by a river or something, is the, is the dash line, is our central moving average, okay? And then imagine that up from the central moving average is a valley that gets steeper and steeper on one side, and it gets steeper and steeper on the other side. And that's this, that steepness is what is represented by our, our, our Bollinger Bands, our different um, levels of Bollinger Bands. And that makes sense because it's actually hard. The way the standard deviation works is it's harder. As, as stocks get further and further away from their central moving average, um, it's harder and harder for them to get even further away. They're, they're drawn back towards the central moving average by the nature of the calculation. Kind of like, again, um, somebody who's hiking, if they try and go up the side of a, of a, of a valley, it's easier, it's gonna get harder and harder as they get further up the side. It's gonna be easier for them to come back down into the middle of the valley. So anyway, that was, that was the, the idea of behind calling this a volatility valley. Um, but it has some really interesting characteristics. Um, notice how the uh, purple, uh, first off notice that the Bollinger Bands are shaded pr in purple. Uh, second off, notice how the purple gets lighter and lighter as we go higher and higher up the valley or further and further away from the moving average. So how did we construct this? What are the settings that I use to make this happen? Um, and then we'll, I'll come back to this in terms of what can we learn also from looking at this. But this is the punchline. This is, this is what we're trying to make uh, for, our, for our chart. And so how are we gonna do this? 
Again, it's, it's using the ribbon technique, and the ribbon technique says you plot the same indicator again and again and again, but, but you modify the one of the parameters, not both, but one of the parameters a little bit as you go. So in this case, I took that second parameter, which is normally 2.0, and I created two that were less than that, um, 1.6 and then 1.2. And I created two that were more than that, 2.4 and 2.8. And again, I, I, why did I choose those particular increments? Just trial and error. I tried it. I, I saw what it looked, what looked good, changed it around. Didn't hurt. Always you know, trying and experimenting with these indicators is one of my main messages to you today. It doesn't hurt. You absolutely want to be, be playing with them until you feel like you can, you can control them instead of them controlling you. Now, over here in the uh, attributes area, I added some more things to make our display more useful. I could have just stopped where I was with these parameters, but I would have had kind of a jumble of lines. I really wanted something a little more you know, topographic, if you will, <laughs> for, my, for my chart. And so the first thing I did was I changed the style from automatic, which is essentially a line style, to area. That's what gave me the colors in the case of Bollinger Bands, using the area style will color the area between the upper band and the lower band. Now, if I had just changed it to area and I hadn't changed anything else, it would have been a big, huge mistake because the whole, my, my chart would be just a big, huge jumble of color. Um, and it wouldn't have been, had very interesting information. So the next thing I did was first, I made sure all the colors were the same. And I use purple. You don't have to. You can use whichever color you want. But the most important thing I did was net is what I did next, and that was I lowered the opacity. Opacity or opaqueness uh, has to do with how transparent something is, and it's a number between zero and one. If something has an opacity of one, that means it's not it's solid. You can't see through it. It's 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 solid, um, and that's actually the default opacity. If you don't change opacity. The, uh, the value we use will be 1, 1 1.0, and that means that you won't be able to see through it. You won't be able to see anything underneath it. On the other hand, if you set the opacity to 0, then the thing is invisible. It's completely transparent, um, and so it doesn't actually uh, really appear on the chart if it has an opacity of 0. Notice I've used, in this case, I've used an opacity of 0.3. That means it's most, it's somewhat see-through, but not fully. And that's exactly what we need. The other thing to keep in mind with opacity is that it builds up. If you have several um, 0.3 things stacked on top of each other, then the actual opacity of what results will be more than 0.3. It'll be something like 0.6. And so what we've done here is we've taken these Bollinger Bands and we've stacked them on top of each other and the opacities are going to get denser and denser the more that are on top of each other. Does that make sense? So that's, that's how we get this volatility valley effect. Um, the, it's darker in the middle because all of the other Bollinger Band areas, all the other 0.3s of opacity have been added together to make this really dark area in the center. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. But this is the result. And again, what we can see is what I was mentioning before is as we take the, um, the number and we make it bigger. So this outer band, this, this band at the top of the valley, if you will, is the 2.8 band. Um, whereas the one that's closest to the trail down here at the, towards the bottom of the valley, right near the uh, central moving average, is the uh, 1.2. So the smaller we make this number, the closer the bands get to the central moving average. The larger we make the number, the further away we get. And the more dramatic the swings will be. And you see like a very dramatic swing here as the stocks started to move sideways. Um, basically this indicator is saying, oh, I've decided I was wrong. It's not really as volatile as I thought it was. And boom, I'm going to, I'm going to I'm come down to this really narrow neck at least for a little bit, and then things break out again. So we've, we can use, again, we can use this kind of display to learn more about the personality of Bollinger Bands. Um, and uh, again, changing time frames, changing uh, symbols, 
maybe even changing the type of um, stock that uh, uh, ticker symbol that we're looking at, maybe changing it from a stock to an index or from an index to a mutual fund, so on and so forth. All that stuff can be very instructive in terms of telling us whether or not uh, or what, what are the Bollinger Band settings that make the most sense for us. So we see, for instance, here, another thing we see as um, it was, the stock was moving up during this period of time, here in September through November, but it was doing so in a fairly chaotic way. It was kind of jumping up and down. We have lots of gaps, so on and so forth. And the Bollinger Bands were kind of uh, very confused because notice how the, the price bars actually almost got to the top of the, um, of the canyon rim, if you will, or the valley rim if you will. Um, that's because they were moving in a fairly a volatile way, a fairly um, chaotic way, and were able to break out. The moving average didn't react fast enough, and the, the upper bands didn't react fast enough either. So that's the kind of thing that happens. But notice that they did snap back. Um, they could not continue up here in this um, kind of far away uh, space for very long. Gravity in the case of our valley analogy, gravity is going to inv invariably bring them back towards the middle. And that's the idea behind Bollinger Bands. See the same thing happened here, so on and so forth. Okay, so I hope that helps. I ho again, I hope you get the, uh, the general idea and the gist of, of what I'm going for with this ribbon technique. You can use the same technique on any indicator, certainly any overlay. I'm just, I've demonstrated it now for two of them for you, the, the moving averages and uh, the Bollinger Bands, but you can use them for other ones as well. Uh, I'm going to stop for just a second, see if we have any questions that have come in yet. Rachel's going to tell me the questions and I'll repeat <laughs> them into the microphone. Yeah. Okay, great question. Uh, I mentioned it. So he, the, the question was, um, if I have a short duration chart, is the accuracy of my EMAs or any indicator based on the EMA, and, and he mentioned the special K, which is one of Martin Pring's indicators. If I shorten up my chart, am I going to get a less accurate result was, is the question. Great question, and the answer at stock charts is definitely not. The answer at stock charts is we work really hard to make sure that's not the case. The numbers should never ever change um, if you go from, from a, a 10 year chart down to a one day chart. Uh, the calculations are gonna be the same. We're gonna use all the data that's necessary in order to create the, um, create the answer uh, that's accurate because accuracy is one of our primary missions here at stock charts. Now, I got to say, um, it's not necessarily the case with other tools that are out there, especially some of those early interactive tools that were available. Some of our, some of the competitors' competition that, that had interactive tools back in the day, maybe five years ago, ten years ago, um, they, the internet wasn't quite so fast, um, and they took some shortcuts in terms of the amount of data that they were willing to send to those interactive client tools. Um, we never took those shortcuts because all of our stuff, Sharp Charts, is working on the server. We're using our servers to generate those charts, and only after the charts have been generated did they get sent to you. Now, um, that said, this also does bring up a point about um, our new tool. So we are, as I mentioned at the start of the show, we're getting ready to release uh, a second charting tool called Stock Charts ACP, our Advanced Charting Platform. And that is a tool which does work on the client and therefore is susceptible to this problem, to the problem at the, at the core of this question. Um, but again, accuracy is what we are super focused on. And so we have made a lot of, um, we've done a lot of work actually, uh, put a lot of energy into making absolutely sure that even though Stocktrace ACP runs on the client, it still gives you the exact same answers, the exact same accuracy level that we get from our server um, side charts. Uh, and again, our server side charts, um, let's say that um, you need, uh, you're need you using an EMA and the, the chart uh, ends a year ago. And so it's a one year chart. We'll actually get data from up to five, even 10 years before the start of the chart. 
in order to start calculating those EMAs and getting everything working properly so that not only is it accurate by the end of the chart, by the right edge of the chart, but it's accurate at the very first bar on the left edge of the chart, at the very beginning of the chart, it's still super accurate. That's the kind of uh, addition, it requires additional data, but we go ahead and do the extra work to make sure that it's accurate everywhere. Uh, great question, and, and again, um, he, the question was also asked in context of Martin Pring's Special K, which is an, uh, an indicator that uh, Martin Pring uh, developed. Uh, you can read about it in our chart school area. It's uh, quite unique because it has a lot of parameters, I, I think uh, eight, some, something like that. Uh, there are lots of different moving averages that go into its calculation, and uh, you absolutely should can use this ribbon technique to uh, experiment with, with the special K indicator and learn how modifying each of those parameters can affect the indicator. In fact, that's, that's some more homework for you. I think that would be a great, a great experiment to do, um, frankly, because there are so many parameters in that particular indicator. Anyway, so great question. Great question. Anything else, Rach? Okay, so Rachel said she's putting a link to the special indicator in the chat, um, in the chart school article. Mm -hmm. And again, I just I do want to um, make sure that people are aware of how to get more help uh, from stock charts. There is several different formats that we have for um, helping and, and giving you more information about everything that I'm talking about today, as well as much, much more. First off, um, we have our chart school area. And if you haven't been there, I strongly encourage you to just go, take a day, take, take an hour, and uh, poke around in there. It's the Wikipedia of technical analysis. You have the ability to, to, you might start reading about one thing, and then you click on a link, and you, now you're reading about another thing, and then you're clicking on a link, and you're, actually, you're an accidental ornithologist by the end of it all. But it's, it's every single indicator that we have on our site is documented in Chart School, usually including a description, the history of the indicator, the, the formula, the mathematical formula of the indicator, and often even an Excel spreadsheet showing you the actual calculations of the indicator as well. Um, so Chart School is the place to go. When you, when you drop down the, all the that overlay drop down and you see that there are all those different indicators that you can add, and you need to know more about them, Chart School is the place to go where you can learn more. And again, I've just shown you a couple of, of some of them. Some of them are, are, much, are, are an entire show to themselves, like the Ichimoku cloud overlay, so on and so forth. So don't forget about Chart School, and there's a, there's a, a tab at the top of all, any of our pages that will take you to Chart School. It's very easy to get to. Um, now there's also, I'll point this out, uh, at the top of our charts and to the right is a help link. And uh, a lot of people will overlook that help link. Uh, don't make that mistake. The help link gives you access to our support area, and it will tell you how to use our website. So if your question is not about how an indicator works, that's a chart school question, but instead your question is about how does the website work? How does, who, which drop down do I use to make, to change this setting? Um, how, and even how do I um, change my account? How do I um, upgrade or downgrade my account? All the different kinds of questions about using the website, you're gonna wanna click on that help link and go into our support area. So not only is that full of instructional articles, but then also that's where you can send questions uh, and, and um, cases to our support team. And we do have a support team. They're here, um, I won't say 24 seven, but they're here very, uh, very dedicated um, and uh, try and get answers to you as quickly as possible. And the way you contact them is through that help link. And then finally, you're actually looking at the, uh, what I think is one of the newest and most exciting ways that we're helping uh, customers understand how to use our website, and that is Stock Charts TV. Um, we are continually doing shows like this one that are instructional, should help you learn more about how to use the site. You'll see instructional shows like we're doing right now, but you'll also see commentary shows during the week where you'll see um, other experts using our tools, and then you'll hopefully pick up tips and tricks from them by watching them use it. And as I mentioned, there are lots and lots of replays on YouTube, including a replay of this show here in just a little bit. Now I'm getting down towards the end. I'm gonna say thank you for watching for this particular show, and there's the link to YouTube. But we are available, we got a little more time, and we are available to answer some questions. So I do wanna open it up in case anybody has any additional questions for me on this particular show. 
We good, do we have anything yet? No. Nope. <laughs> Are y'all awake? <laughs> I know it's Saturday, but um, well, hopefully it's because you're too busy going out there and uh, working with those um, uh, moving average ribbons, so on and so forth. Let me take 10 seconds and do a live demo, probably be a little more than 10 seconds, and do a live demo of this stuff. So I'm going to come over here, pull up my web browser, and give you a live demonstration from StockCharts.com. So here's our home page, and I'm already logged in, so I can just immediately type a ticker symbol here, such as IBM, press enter. Here is our workbench, as I mentioned, and I have my default settings here, pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm going to blow this up just a tad so you can see the chart a little better. And um, the overlay area that we're talking about is over, is over here, and right now I don't have any overlays on this chart, so it's all empty. I have one indicator. I'm going to clear that out, empty it up. Now I've got a chart with, with nothing on it. We're going to start adding our overlays back. And the first thing I want to do is just simulate. I'm going to do a live simulation of the volatility valley. So I'm going to take Bollinger Band, Bollinger Band, Bollinger Band, Bollinger Band, and one more, I think. Okay, and now they're all 20, 2, and I saw it was um, one point. 2, and then 1.6, and then 2.4, and then 2.8. And I mentioned if I just do that with no other changes, I get something that's kind of useful, but it's also kind of a mess. Let me get rid of volume. I'm going to come down here to the volume overlay and turn volume off. There we are. So that's nice, but it's a, and we might could use that. That might could be good enough, but I, I think it's a mess, so I want to do the, the, the valley thing. So the next thing I'm going to do is take the style and turn it to area. One, two, three, four, and five. And the color, well, let's just do, let's just do update. Bonk. So this is what I meant by it's just a big mess of uh, blobs of, of stuff kind of obscuring the chart at this point. So we do need to make some more changes to get this into a useful configuration. Next thing I'm going to do is change the color, and I'm going to turn it all to a particular color. I'm going to go, so I did purple in the demonstration, but let's go with uh, gold. Gold's also kind of fun. Uh, gold, 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 and gold. So one more time. All right, so that's okay, but not great. We next want to do the final, the piece de resistance, the final part is to take the opacity down to 0.3. Oops, 0.3. And hit, finally hit update. And there's our volatility valley in gold for us uh, to look at. We can see the, uh, the path down here, and we can see the, the walls coming in and coming out. So that's, that's nice. Now let me, we'll do a little more playing with this. I'm going to do something I didn't, I mentioned in, in another show here. I'm going to use the range slider that we call ranger to kind of interactively start to play with my, my value. I'm going to take range and do select, start, and end. And when I make that setting, when I choose that choice in range, I now have our ranger control that's over here on the right. This is an interactive tool that allows me to move the start and end date of my chart around. And this is great, as I mentioned earlier, once you've got your kind of volatility valley display or your ribbon display, whatever kind of ribbon you're choosing to use, uh, you can then do a little exploring and see how the indicator has behaved in the past. And I can also drag the edges of this. Everyone see what I did here? I, again, I changed in the range, I changed it to select start and end. And then this slider appeared. It wasn't there before. And now I can drag in the middle of this to move ahead. And I can also click, oh, this is one of my favorite things. I can click on the little triangle here and go ahead one dot, at a, one period at a time. And so that's going to give me kind of a real time, like a simulation of what I would have seen had we been watching this stock back in July of 2018. 
yes, you can right click on the slider and do something like year to date, so on and so forth, or you can do six months, however you want to do it. So, so this Ranger slider combined with the ribbon is going to give you a great educational overview of what this, what this indicator is all about. So hopefully that was pretty clear and straightforward. Um, I'll show one other thing. Just get a different indicator that we have. So I've, I've, I just hit clear all to get rid of all those indicators and or all those overlays. Now I'm back. These are all the different overlays that we have available. And as I mentioned, they're all written up in our, our um, chart school. We've talked about simple moving averages and exponential moving averages. There's also Kaufman's moving average, Perry Kaufman, which I really, actually, I really like and I need to talk more about. We've got SMA and EMA envelopes. They're very similar to Bollinger Bands and you can do the same kind of valley-like display with them if you want to experiment with them. So on and so forth. Um, and then finally, price by volume. I was mentioning this at the start of the show. It shows you the... Um, the, where, the, where the volume is built up, at which range volume is built up. So let me put volume back on as an overlay. And let me take my volume by price and take the opacity. I'm going to take the opacity down just a touch and then hit update. And this again is something where, remember the, the, volatil, the price by volume in overlay uh, is only depends on the, the chart that you're looking at. So if you change the start or end date of the chart, then the uh, display will change uh, sig and potentially significantly. And so I'm going to drag this back just a little bit. And what I'm looking for, I still haven't found it yet, is, is a situation, oh good grief, this stock might not have one. I'm going to do a different stock. Let's go with, um, see if Microsoft has something. Um, what, what I'm looking for again, you use price by volume when you want to spot um, support and resistance levels. And a lot of times you'll either get one of two things. You'll either get kind of what we see, let's say what we see here, we see it in a, we see a single peak. In this case the peak is kind of down towards the bottom, but it's just one peak and then everything else is kind of tailing off. Or if I go back further, I'm going to try and find one where it's really clear cut. Uh, this, is a, this is an okay example. There, there are probably better ones around. But we have two peaks essentially here. We have a peak here and a shorter peak down here. A lot of times you'll see on some stocks you'll see two peaks where the peaks are almost at the same exact height. And that'll show you that the stock has been in a trading range for a while. And you have one peak at the top of the trading range and the other peak at the bottom of the trading range. Um, I'm, I've kind of screwed things up here. There, okay, there we go. A little more there and there, kind of get a sense of that. So I just wanted to quickly show you guys um, price by volume. Another one of my favorite indicators. They're all my favorites. I love them all. Um, the cloud charts. Again, I could do an entire show on those. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to start to wrap this up unless there was any other questions that snuck in at the end there. Okay. Here is where you can see the replay up on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's going to be up there soon. We need just a little bit of time to, uh, to download it and massage it, and then we'll put it, post it up on YouTube. You can watch it later. Um, I cannot, though, uh, express how much, first off, I appreciate doing these shows. I really do enjoy them. And second off, hopefully you got a sense of it is fun to play with this stuff. It's fun to, to ask, your, ask yourself, what if I change this? What if I change that? What if I tweak this around, so on and so forth? You can't hurt yourself. Make, do these settings, step back, look at the chart, see what makes sense to you, what doesn't make sense, and see what fits your inv investing and trading style. But with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Again, thank you very much for spending your time with us today learning all about overlays on Sharp Charts. Take care, everybody.